so grateful for that. Let's let's take a minute and just recognize that Robbie has stayed silent. He's <laughs> unmuted himself. He's about to speak. No, you know what happened? I don't know. I don't know if Kirtan meant to do it, but he didn't hit the record button until after you were finished with your monologue. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll say that um, it's not on tape. I, I every time on tape, you're in, you will remain interrupted. <laughs> Kirtan is very smart to uh, bypass my shenanigans. <laughs> <laughs> he knows he has to, I don't know if you guys watch The Office, uh, but there is this episode with uh, with the uh, um, secretary and uh, Michael Scott where she would um, triage his calls, but before actually sending it to him, she would say, oh, the call is on line one, then he would, he would click line one and then he would say something ridiculous. And then like, she, but she wouldn't let the call through. And then once he got out of his system, she would then let the call through. I feel like Kirtan just pulled, pulled that on me. So I'm like the Michael Scott equivalent. So let Reza say something ridiculous. And then we hit the record button. Anyways, Mike to you, Robbie. <laughs> well, with your humor, you bypassed it and, and trumped it all, my friends. So <laughs> well played, well played. Um, I see a dear friend who's unmuted today uh, who uh, reached out and is going to be presenting a case today. Little does Muhammad know that um, I did some secret spying on his Twitter account and found out that he is an elite swimmer and actually won um, a swimming competition very, very recently. So um, we know that your clinical reasoning and VMR skills are on par with your swimming skills, which are unbelievably cool. And it's a delight um, to welcome you here to have you present a case. So I'll, I'll pass the mic to you to unmute, to tell us more about yourself, the incredible, I think they're books, I can't tell if they're books behind you, um, and a little bit about your life, <laughs> a little bit about your life outside medicine. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Ravi, for your introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you and discussing the cases. It's been always a great pleasure, and I've learned a lot uh, by attending all the VMR cases. Uh, I'm an intern or, like, or last year medical student at King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. And I have a great passion for medical education, and I would, I would like to pursue uh, a career in tenor medicine. Incredible. A fellow internist. I absolutely love it. Tell us about your swimming accomplishments. What is, what is the story of you swimming and what are you doing now? <laughs> yeah, in terms of swimming, I've been swimming since I was probably six or seven years old. I uh, joined a couple of uh, teams throughout my life. Uh, I was a member of the national swimming team. And then when I joined the university, uh, I joined the university national swimming team and I started competing against other universities and we, we go uh, into na to nationals and international competitions and, and yeah. <laughs> Amazing, y'all seeing the humility here is like completely, like if you didn't, if you should just scroll his Twitter feed to see what, to see the real truth, but I appreciate you being so humble. Thank uh, you. Well, it's a delight to have you here. I think um, you've been part of the VMR community for such a long time and today I'm presenting a case. Can't wait to hear it. I will pass the mic to you to um, jump right in and for Prof. Rez to take the first out button. All right. So um, this is a 73 year old male, patient presented to the ED with vague or poorly localized abdominal pain for three days duration. He was in his usual state of health until three days ago when he ate from outside and the abdominal pain started gradually. It was an on off. It was exacerbated with walking and relieved by laying down. And the pain severity was five out of 10, no radiation. Uh, the pain increased in severity overnight, which prompted the patient to go to the ED. Should I leave you with this, Alec Quart? And then. That, that sounds great, Mohammed. Um... In fact, I thought the case was going to be a young person who went swimming in some kind of lake <laughs> and then got some kind of organism. Uh, but here we have the case of a 73-year-old who presents with poorly localized abdominal pain. I'll make a few comments and then pass the mic to Robbie. And immediately, I am um, triggered to think of what Charmaine taught me about abdominal pain. And what she taught me is that these organs within the abdomen are so close to one another that 
a flare or pathology or injury in one of the organs may actually have pain in a different region because they're so packed in. So I love this case already because it's telling us what's really happening within the abdomen, which this pain is poorly localized. Of course, when you do have focal pain, we build our differential diagnosis on the location of that pain, but we always have to keep in mind what Charmin teaches us that really it's very hard to put significant weight on the location of pain, just given how packed these visceral organs are. Um, with regard to uh, this patient's presentation, what's really striking to me, and I'll make this comment in the past the mic to Robbie, is that oftentimes when we think of abdominal pain, we think of something happening within the peritoneum. However, you have to be open to referred pain from organs outside of the viscera. And what organs? Well, from the kidneys, to the heart, to the lung, to the uh, GYN system in uh, women. And here, um, Muhammad told us something very interesting, that this patient's pain is relieved with um, lying down, if I'm not mistaken, Muhammad, is that correct? And then worsen with movement. Um, I think that's what he said, although I'm, I'm reading oh, something. Oh, please. Yes, uh, it's exacerbated with walking or by walking okay. and then relieved if the patient lays down. So that was really important because all of a sudden you go from the abdomen to the heart. This almost sounds like angina. Uh, so in this patient who's older, will be very interested in the past medical history, but the organ that gets prioritized here isn't so much an abdominal organ, but it's, it's the heart. Um, let me pass the mic to Robbie to see what else you'd like to layer on. You know, I, I think this, this reflection is just full of pearls. And I, I think I, I have nothing to add, but to tell you that it's really important to have multiple different views on the same problem. And so you might ask, what is the view uh, that is practical for, for uh, approaching abdominal pain? And it comes with the following realization. I'm going to ask the group. So put your answer in the chat. What kind of physician by specialty or training is the physician most often diagnosing the cause of abdominal pain? Is it an internal medicine doctor? Is it an ER doctor? Is it a family doctor? Is it a lab medicine doctor? Is a pathologist? Is general surgery ER? It's a Google, Google doctor. <laughs> so true. <laughs> yeah, Jorge, that's amazing. Internal medicine. Okay. Robbie's kind doctor. Yes, thank you, Tiago. OBGYN. I absolutely love it. I love you all, but I'm going to disagree. It's a radiologist. It's a radiologist. Yes, um, all those doctors are involved in the journey, but most of these doctors get a call from radiology saying, hey, I think there's appendicitis. Hey, I think there's diverticulitis. Hey, I think there's acute mesenteric ischemia. I think there's cholecystitis, cholangitis, anything that you can say itis except pancreatitis. It's diagnosed by a radiologist. So you have to be practical. You are the frontline provider who's going to decide if you're going to need the radiologist today, and if you are going to make a specific diagnosis of abdominal pain, there's only about 10 or 11 diagnoses that you can make without the help of a radiologist. And so um, as you go through this case, I encourage you to practice, well, what falls on you, the non-radiologist, be it the ER doctor, internal medicine doctor, OBGYN, anybody, what falls on you to make the diagnosis? And Reza said some very important ones. The most important ones are if you take a CT scan of the abdomen pelvis and send it to a radiologist, but the pathology lies in the thorax, they're not going to pick it up. So I don't have any wisdom to share apart from the following. Remember that the workhorse for abdominal pain is a CT scan, and the, the doc who's making the diagnosis is often a radiologist. And so the question for you being practical is, can't lean too much and lean too heavily on that. What about the diagnoses that non-radiologists make? And what if the radiologists are wrong or miss something? So that's the practical approach to abdominal pain, which we'll try to layer throughout this conversation. 
But in all likelihood, this person needs a CT scan unless you find one of those 10 exceptions. And you have to be prepared for if that CT scan is negative from, from the beginning, or if it's positive, what that essentially signifies. All right, I'll pass the mic back to you, Mohammed. All right, uh, so far so good. I love all the prayers. <laughs> um, okay, so he had also a non-bloody, non-mucoidaria, Bristol type six, uh, nausea, no, no, no sorry, uh, he had no, he was nauseated, but there was no vomiting, uh, no constipation, no bleeding from any office, uh, no uh, chest pain, no diaphoresis, no palpitations or any shortness of breath. Um, he had also negative constitution symptoms, ex except for decreased appetite, um, no lower, um, no dysuria, urgency, frequency, or any other lower ur urinary tract symptoms, uh, no neurological symptoms, and uh, other review of systems were uh, unremarkable. And uh, should I should I continue and give you another aliquot uh, in terms of his past medical history? Okay, so uh, his, his past medical history includes um, liver cirrhosis, child C, and meld sodium score of 30, secondary to Wilson's disease, uh, diagnosed at the age of 15 years old. And he had also a recent episode of, uh, or recent diagnosis of peptic acid disease due to helico uh, helicobacter pylori infection, which was treated uh, with triple therapy. Uh, past surgical history, he had an uh, upper endoscopy done last year, which showed multiple small clean based ulcer in the duodenum, uh, but the duodenum biopsy showed normal mucosa with no dysplastic changes, uh, just a bit of acute, or, um, it was, the comment was that it, there was some acute and chronic inflammation and prominent eosinophilia. Um, antral biopsy showed mild gastritis, and there was also a small cluster of gastric varices, which needed clamping, and uh, which needed uh, clipping. Um, his medications include penicillamine, zinc, um, furosemide, pyridoxin, spironolactone, and zinc gluconate. His social history is um, uh, evident for milk, camel milk congestion, but no recent travel, no recent uh, contact with someone who is sick, is fully vaccinated, um, no animals at home, um, is a non-smoker, non-alcoholic, and no illicit, and no use of illicit drugs. His family history is also negative for any particular concern and um, non-consanguinous parents. And I'll leave you with that, and then maybe I can give you some more data on the examination. You know, I'll take a moment to reflect on how important the nausea is here and then pass the background data for Prof. Rest to analyze. I can't tell you enough how, um, uh, how troubling nausea is. Um, in general, it's okay to be frustrated with the autonomic nervous system, which mediates the sensation of nausea. And it's frustrating because the autonomic nervous system is very, very nonspecific. It doesn't really tell you where the problem is when the autonomic system is activated. That is why when your pancreas hurts, you can't specifically point to the pancreas or when your appendix hurts, you can't quite point to the appendix until it irritates the parietal peritoneum and it hits your somatic nervous system. So frankly, the autonomic nervous system is abysmal at specificity, but what it's phenomenal at is its sensitivity. It's almost impossible to have severe sinister disease without nausea, be it disease all the way from the brain with elevated intracranial pressure to disease of the toe. Your body responds non-specifically, but dramatically when it's in trouble. And nausea tends to be an almost universal feature of sinister disease anywhere from head to toe. So it's almost helpful to say, what are the causes of abdominal pain that lack nausea and vomiting? And those are the ones that are at the surface, abdominal wall diseases, like endometrial, endometrial implants, mm -hmm. epiploic appendagitis, which is a fancy term for saying that you have fat necrosis of the abdominal wall, which is pretty common. So here, the, the, the presence of nausea is an alarm feature. It tells you that the autonomic system is being engaged, which you should encode to mean that the the, the depth of the uh, pathophysiology here is deep. It's deeper than the somatic nervous system, which means it's deeper than the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, which means 
it's a problem. And so um, I paid a lot of attention to that. Even though he's not vomiting, the fact that he's nauseous would practically mean in the emergency room, emergency room that he goes into a bed and gets an IV and gets a, a very close eyes on him. As opposed to maybe somebody who has a little bit of pain without nausea and vomiting, you may choose to, uh, to go a little bit slower in, in your workup. All right, Prof. Rez, Mike, to you. That terrific point with localization, Robbie, based on the patient's nausea. And I have to say, that this background information is very intriguing. And the question becomes, how much effort do we place in bringing this background information to the foreground? I would say it would be a mistake to solely rely on the background information and to try to make all sorts of connections on how it can relate to this patient's presentation. But we will touch the surface for now and we might come and revisit the background information as we get more data from the physical exam, the labs, and possible imaging. I do want to say um, right off the bat, I was concerned about pathology within the heart, specifically coronary artery disease. But the more um, symptoms like diarrhea, um, nausea, although those nausea can certainly be associated with um, coronary artery disease and angina, the more and more you're coming towards the GI tract. But because of the morbidity of potentially missing something within the cardiovascular system, the spotlight is still shining on that heart. Though, as you get diarrhea, maybe you start pivoting towards the gastrointestinal lumen. With regard to Wilson's disease, I, you, know, you wanna applaud the doctors who diagnosed this patient at the age of 15. And the patient may have presented with a Coombs negative, um, hemolytic anemia and may have had CNS system, uh, symptoms that eventually led to this diagnosis. But you say cirrhosis, abdominal pain. The first question is, how compensated is this patient? Uh, so the physical exam and imaging is going to be critical because if this patient has ascites, a very morbid diagnosis that cannot be missed would be spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And um, in fact, in any patient who comes to the hospital with ascites, you want to perform a diagnostic paracentesis in the context of cirrhosis, even if they don't have abdominal pain, because many of those patients with infection of that acidic fluid may be totally asymptomatic. Um, the eosinophils, you know, you can't, there is a diagnosis known as eosinophilic gastroenteritis, but it's very nonspecific and can be present in all sorts of um, various illnesses and may just reflect some allergic tendencies that this patient has. The camel milk ingestion, of course, in this audience, everyone is excited and maybe people are Googling what can happen when someone ingests a camel milk? I have no idea. I'm gonna remove the camel part of it and ask the question is, is if the milk is pasteurized or not, but you have to recognize that there can be so many infections associated with unpasteurized milk from brucella, listeria, mycobacterium bovis, a whole list, um, but, in order to um, really uh, consider those diagnoses, I, I would say they may have had a more prolonged course. Maybe they have extra intestinal manifestations that may prioritize them. So it's good to run through that checklist, but you can't really anchor on any specific bacteria at this juncture. So all is to say, my dear friend Mohammed, is we have an elderly gentleman with a history of cirrhosis who, um, had ingested camel milk and now is presenting with nausea, poorly localized abdominal pain, and some non-bloody diarrhea um, that improves at rest and worsens with exertion. You see how long that PR is? It's not a great PR because I'm not yet ready to prioritize a specific DDAG. So I'm very much looking forward to the physical exam and uh, additional data that you have for us, Mohammed. Sure. All right, so the examination, the general examination of the patient, he was alert, conscious and oriented uh, to date, time and place. Temperature was 38.5 um, and the blood pressure was 100, 
2 over 65, respiratory rate 19, and oxygen saturation normal in room air. A heart rate was 113. Cardiovascular examination normal, S1, S2, no thrills, no murmurs, no JVD distension. Um, he has plus two lower limb edema uh, up to the level of the knees or below that a bit. Um, respiratory examination is normal, bilateral entry, vesicular breathing, resonant chest, normal chest expansion. His GI examination uh, reveals clear ectris and abdominal tenderness. Uh, worst in the epigastric area and the right lumbar region uh, or quadrant, and no rigidity, guarding, or palpable masses, no organomegaly, but there was positive shifting dullness, uh, yet no fluid thrill. Um, otherwise, negative uh, negative signs of no, no, no tenderness at McBurney's point, uh, no rebound tenderness, and... Uh, um, no up to negative sewers or obturator signs. So no, we sort of uh, ruled out acute abdomen. Uh, and also neuro neurological examination was normal and he had no lymphadenopathy. Fascinating. <laughs> Maybe I'll focus just on the vital signs and leave the rest for Robbie to tackle. And I think that... Um, when we see these vital signs, basically our mind should translate this to inflammation. And when your mind translates it to inflammation and you're dealing with an acute process, infection becomes prioritized. So now we apply the background data and say, okay, this patient with cirrhosis, could there be ascites? Could the patient have spontaneous bacterial peritonitis? Patients with cirrhosis have um, decreased immunoglobulin synthesis and are at risk of encapsulated organisms that usually leave their mark within the lung, not so much the abdomen, like streptococcal pneumonia or H influenza. Um, then you look at the milk ingestion and you're like, okay, could the milk have had a bacteria or some kind of um, you know, infectious organism that led to an inflammatory state? So at this juncture, just with the vital signs, infection is prioritized you know, tenfold. Um, so I will leave it at that and then uh, pass the mic to Ravi. <laughs> You know, uh, brevity is the soul of wit, which is a, 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 um, a saying I never understood until I heard Prof. Rez, which in, la in the last minute, he's basically taken this very complex set of vital signs and told you its infection uh, increased tenfold, which I absolutely love. And I will say um, the exam is giving you a, a way to represent the problem, which may be, uh, which is inherently imperfect, but a good place to start. And what is that problem? This patient who has a history of cirrhosis is now presenting with decompensated cirrhosis with, a, with one caveat. What is decompensated cirrhosis? Decompensated cirrhosis fundamentally is the AKI on CKD for the liver. It is evidence of an uh, end, end stage liver disease with an acute decompensation. And how is that diagnosed? It is diagnosed um, with either evidence of parenchymal dysfunction of the liver itself, so an increase in the INR, a drop in the albumin, or increase, increase in bilirubin, and or an increase in portal pressure. So either the liver parenchyma goes down, or there is evidence of worsening portal hypertension. And here you have both. If you presume, which is not perfect, that the icterus is direct hyperbilirubinemia, the shifting dullness is transudative ascites, which again is an assumption, um, and that the edema um, is part of that process, you can say there is both evidence of parenchymal dysfunction and evidence of portal hypertension. But you can see how we could be completely wrong. This icterus could be hemolytic anemia from Wilson's disease. The shifting dullness could be um, uh, ascites from an exudative process like malignancy, like hepatocellular carcinoma, and the edema may be because of IVC compression. But this is the point of a problem representation. It is always a working hypothesis until data comes later that completely either reinforces it or, um, or changes it. So um, this, a working problem representation is basically entering this space. And here's that space. What causes decompensated cirrhosis? And the simplest thing is, well, you're not taking the, you're, you stop doing the things that have helped you maintain your cirrhosis, which in this case includes all these non-specific therapies, but also specific therapy in this case with Wilson's disease therapy that he's taking. 
The parenchymal dysfunction is, is most morbidly development of hepatocellular carcinoma, progression of the underlying disease, and any acute disease. So if this patient goes on an alcohol binge, um, they will have parenchymal dysfunction. The other thing to keep in mind is portal hypertension can get worsened by reduced flow into the portal vein. And the reduced flow can happen because of worsening portal hypertension. So that is most commonly because of a thrombus there. A thrombus in the portal vein restricts flow even more, causing the liver to go down. More commonly though, it's not a venous problem that reduces portal flow, it's an arterial inlet problem. And that's a confusing concept, but basically anything that drops the arterial volume from coming into the gut and then into the portal circulation. And that happens for two reasons. You are vasodilated because you are a patient with cirrhosis and underwent surgery and surgery is the most vasodilatory process under the sun, or more commonly in our, our, our patients, you have an infection. What we worry a lot about too is overdiuresis and, and doing this in the volume perspective or the patient bleeding. So this is where, this is where this disease process is. But here's the biggest lesson. What is the classic presentation of an upper respiratory tract infection in a patient with normal lungs? Rhinitis. What is a classic presentation of the same bug in a patient with structural lung disease? Intubation in the ICU. The presence of, of a dominant background history takes a disease and twists it he could have anything under the sun that's severe and that will cause his liver to decompensate. So you have to be very careful with these patients because they can take the classic presentation of a disease and hijack it and make it look like liver decompensation. So anything under the sun can do this for him, but the most likely mechanism is that he has an infection that has resulted in splanchnic vasodilation dilation resulting in decompensated cirrhosis. So we're back to square one. And that square one is what are the common causes of infections in a patient with liver disease? And good news, it's not so different from what are the common causes of infections in patients period with the addition of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which is something we should look for right away in this patient. All right, Mohammed, back to you. All right, thank you, Ravi. Um, his initial labs um, were showed white blood cells of 8.47, so within the normal range. Hemoglobin 11, MCV normal, platelets were low, 81. And uh, PT, PTT, INR were all pro prolonged. Uh, ALT was 54, AST 116, and ALP uh, 217. Albumin was 21, um, total bilirubin 173, and direct bilirubin was 148. Lipase was normal, lactic acid was elevated, and he had also azotemia, elevated urea, and um, um, elevated creatinine, which were not uh, his baseline. And um, urinalysis was normal, uh, sodium was 128, potassium uh, 4.5, his chloride was 102, phosphate 1.1, and calcium 1.9. He had normal cardiac enzymes and normal tropes, and we sent a septic screen. Stool culture was negative, ovoparasite was negative, C. diff was negative, and blood culture was negative as well, respiratory culture. So, uh, basically, a septic screen was uh, unremarked when all negative. So we wanted to do a paracentesis on him, but he had an elevated INR. So we proceeded with the imaging first. We did an ultrasound, and uh, it showed a cirrhotic liver with no definitive focal lesion, no intra or extra hepatic biliary duct dilation, no signs of acute cholecystitis. Uh, his chest and abdominal x-ray were also normal no, um, with no air under the diaphragm. And after that, we proceeded with correcting his coags and INR with uh, vitamin, K, uh, sorry, vitamin K and PCC. Uh, and we proceeded with the paracentesis. Uh, now, the, we sent the fluid for uh, cell counter differential and the white blood cells of the paracentesis were 2,710. 
and uh, seventy nine percent of that was polymorph, so about two thousand one hundred forty. Um, it had a high sag and turbid dark orange colored when we withdrew the uh, when we withdrew the fluid and bilirubin was uh, within the normal range I think it was below uh, it was more than six uh, protein was less than one glucose was 60 um, and other labs were unremarkable and the cultures were still pending Uh, thank you so much. By the way, I will just call out, I don't know if you guys are watching the screen, the incredible um, team effort of the CP Solvers crew. I see Kirtan scribing furiously, catch up with Muhammad's wisdom, and I see uh, Deborah jumping in and um, tag teaming it, and probably I missed some other um, um, incredible work. So thank you all for um, the incredible effort um, that is all silently and effortlessly happening behind the scenes. We're, uh, we're very grateful for it. You know, I'll, I'll leave the paracentesis for Reza to analyze, and I will tell you that it's not, um, it's not uncommon, um, the laboratory findings that we're seeing here, where the liver is essentially hijacking the clinical presentation. And that's what I meant by that. Like, everything that you see is expected. When you see that the blood um, is, there's poor splanchnic flow to the liver, what happens is the liver starts to shunt it away from the kidneys, so you're starting to see the beginnings of what could be hepatorenal syndrome, which we can reflect on if this case takes that shape. So um, these are these labs were entirely expected, and this is the signature of decompensated cirrhosis. Um, and I think the money is in not overanalyzing them, um, is not spending too much time on the kidney, not spending too much time on the lowest sodium, on the thrombocytopenia. Those are entirely expected in a patient with decompensated liver disease. And so I would gloss over them and be like, oh, okay, noted. Um, I'm not too surprised by them. And they align very fully with what the patient has. And I think the, the, uh, the, the case is pushed forward as it always is with these patients by studying the peritoneal fluid. So I'll pass the mic to Prof Rez for that. Uh, thank you, Robbie. I, I'm just stunned. Is that, or hey, is that a real dog in the background or is that a stuffed animal? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have two here. Oh my gosh, they are like, I am just so stunned. That dog has just been listening to Robbie, which is really hard to do. <laughs> it's, the <only> dog. <laughs> it's the only dog that listens to me, by the way. <laughs> Not this guy. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, please go back to whatever you were doing. I was just so impressed by your dog. So cute. Um, okay, so the acidic fluid. There's really, um, in, in someone who has cirrhosis, and you're sampling their fluid, there's two questions to, to uh, address. Um, one, you sort of expect, and that is what is the SAG? If you're confused about the SAG, let me teach you a simple way to remember what the SAG should be in portal hypertension so you never forget. Portal hypertension. So what is the SAG? The SAG is high, portal high. And then once you know that, you can go and say, oh, okay, that makes sense because fluid is going out, but albumin is not. So there's a big gradient and that's why the SAG is high. So this elevated SAG, it's consistent with portal hypertension. The second question you wanna ask is, does the patient have um, peritonitis, specifically bacterial peritonitis? I didn't say spontaneous because I don't want to anchor on that. And I have to always be open to the possibility of secondary peritonitis. And Mohammed, that's where your exam was so helpful that you, you weren't really concerned for an acute abdomen. But the difference between the two is that one, um, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis happens because you have usually a low protein in the ascites, meaning you have low immunoglobulins. So the patient is very vulnerable to translocation and infection from the gastrointestinal tract, while secondary peritonitis happens because you have a perforation where then you get bacteria that leak out. And we have a really great schema um, that was created by two of our team members. Um, it, Robbie, who is Jack and, uh, but who led that schema for the? I think it was Smitha, Smitha and Smitha. Jack. Yes, it's brilliant. I, if Kiara, if you don't mind, please include that in the chat, um, the, the schema for the uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. But basically this patient meets the criteria. If you're above 250, um, neutrophils, you have bacterial peritonitis. 
Um, when the white blood cell count, the totality of it is very high. Like once you start getting into the thousand, specifically 10,000, then you have to be, you have to start thinking about secondary peritonitis. The, the things that distinguish the two is that with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, usually you're dealing with one organism. It's monomicrobial while secondary peritonitis, because you have just leakage, you have a hole. So gram negative, everything just leaks into that peritoneum. You did, you typically have polymicrobial um, bacterial infection. There are other distinguishing features between the two that's on that schema that is very helpful. So basically what this comes down to, Mohammed, <clears throat> is you have a case of bacterial peritonitis, likely spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And the question becomes, what is the organism at play and how do you treat this patient? So this patient um, most certainly needs uh, antibiotics and albumin, um, just given the, the clinical presentation uh, to, to reduce the morbidity and mortality. With an elevated creatinine, that would be something that pushes you to give um, IV albumin in, in such a patient. The, now we go back again to the background. So if you apply the base rate, you're dealing with a gram negative organism or an anaerobe um, causing this, this infectious process. But then you sort of apply the background of this milk ingestion and you start wondering, could there be an unusual organism that's leading to this patient's bacterial peritonitis? Some of the ones we mentioned like brucella um, as a possible etiology. So what would I do here? Well, we need to culture the, the acidic fluid for sure. We need a gram stain on that acidic fluid. We need to start here. We would start um, ceftriaxone or a fluoroquinolone and IV albumin on day one and day three, and then see what it shows. Um, that is where I am. Uh, Robbie, anything else on your part before we get more data? No, I love it. I think hmm, I'm just inhaling yogurt right now. I think that's the key question is um, why there is peritonitis and why he gets a freebie. He has cirrhosis, his gut immunity is impaired. And so he can have translocation of organisms into the peritoneal space. And the question is, is there any, does, is there anything else that could be happening? And the answer is, yeah, of course, you could have any um, itis, appendicitis, diverticulitis, so on, that does that. Um, but my mind is going to, hey, is there any other clue here? And I'm wondering if the ulcers are a source for him. Is the is his vulnerability from his ulceration? And I'm probably only only wondering that, honestly, because we're in VMR, not in real life. Like in real life, this is SPP until proven otherwise. In this case, the milk exposure is very intriguing. And that's a route to explore um, from a clinical reasoning perspective. And then the other perspective is, does he have a vulnerability through his eosinophilic GI disease? Could that be a portal of entry? Or could that signify a chronic parasitic infection like Strongy that's causing recurrent or um, not recurrent, but at least um, organisms that shouldn't go where they are? Um, I don't know how I would tease that out in real life. Probably just treat for SVP, wait for the cultures and see how the, um, how the syndrome evolves. And eat my yogurt. All right, Mama, back to you. You're going to be our next case, man. We don't know what bacteria is associated <laughs> with that yogurt you're in. All right. I don't know if it's pasteurized. Mama's well, going to present you next week, Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rezan Ravi. Uh, all right. So we followed up his culture in Gramstein and, um, it, and we started him ceftriaxone in Pericle um, for, 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 I think, two grams or one gram IV. Uh, and then he, his culture showed um, and he, his uh, gram staining and culture showed gram negative interior bacteria. So it was E. coli, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, so it was a gram negative uh, interior bacteria, so most likely E. coli. So we continued the ceftriaxone. And for five to seven days, we gave him albumin on day one and day three. And also he had, uh, we consulted hematology for the coagulopathy that he has, and they did a mixing study to just to confirm that it was a, uh, it was related to the factor deficiency um, due to his cirrhosis. And uh, they recommended also giving him uh, vitamin K for three days. It was in maintenance fluids and his labs started to improve. 
um, and his as a team he also cleared and he started to, to improve gradually even clinically I absolutely um, love this Mohammed this is I think a very good case it's it's quite educational it's common it's what we all need to be expert at we don't need to be expert at the uncommon. We need to know the uncommon as best as we can because patients have the uncommon, but we certainly have to be expert or strive for expertise in the common domain. And I just want to share with you guys really quickly um, this uh, just brilliant schema because I think what I really enjoyed um, with this case, Robbie, is that we applied base rate of disease, assuming the case is over and then there isn't a twist like, uh, you know, like the fifth sense, all of a sudden mom has like, hey, this camel organism within the milk ended up being positive and assuming we're done. I, I love it because uh, this is really the, the, the schema that Smita and Jack created and it's just brilliant. Like um, so much rich, richness and we, we use the background data, but we didn't anchor on it. We always apply the base rate of disease throughout this case, what's most frequent. And even when you do these exercises, you want to strive to do that. Strive to keep it as common as possible because that's really what you're going to be seeing in the emergency department. But know the, know the uncommon so you're ready to react. You're ready to land that plane in uh, unusual circumstances. But look at this. This is, I think, a very good um, illness group having all of the relevant data and even the why the pathophysiology. And then this table itself, I think is, is a gold right here. And then finally, you come right here with the treatment and the DDX. So study this schema, it doesn't get better than this. And I'm gonna pass the mic to um, Robbie. Oh, well, I have nothing to add. I think that's an absolutely superb. Um, I still remember the, the, the um, related blog post that was done with this, and it was such an educational experience, the entirety of it. I think uh, one thing I would emphasize is while the culture being, um, uh, one thing that has changed is you might have read or heard that cultures in SVP are rarely positive. That's, that depends on your technique. So we used to actually just grab the fluid and put it in a bedside, uh, one of those like bedside uh, bottles and send it. But if you culture the fluid in blood culture bottles, the yield is 80 to 90%. So it's no longer uh, true that, um, that S SBP is a culture negative diagnosis. If you inoculate your cultures bedside with blood culture bottles, you will dramatically increase your yield. What is a little bit unusual is the gram stain being positive. So the gram stain is a proportional to the, um, the burden of the organism. And most cases of SPP, there's not much organism, which is why you need those blood culture bottles to actually grow it. So um, I think this case is classic for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And I don't know what the number is. It's probably around 50% that you'll see a gram stain being positive. So just know that unlike most infections, from a sterile site like the peritoneum, um, it is relatively unusual to get a grand stain being positive. And the reason for that is the pathophysiology, a small amount of bacteria um, gets translocated. Um, but I, I, um, I love that, uh, that illness script. I think the two people who worked on it have done tremendous things for the CP solvers, one of whom is actually, I think Jack is actually hanging out here. Um, Jack, do you have any, um, I don't want to put you on the spot in case you're doing other work or whatnot, but any other thoughts or wisdom to impart before we hand the mic to Mohammed? No, I just think that, um, uh, I still remember so fondly the email exchange that, that, that went along with sort of, sort of understanding that top right corner box, the culture negative neutrocytic ascites of like the SBPs are greater or the PMNs are greater than 250, but the culture is negative. And I think sort of, sort of seeing it, yes, it could potentially be an SBP variant, sort of like the sub person got, got antibiotics already. Maybe there's, there's, there's a poor, a, um, a poor culture yield, but not necessarily assuming that, that the, that the final diagnosis is actually SBP in that case, but recognizing that there is a DDX for indeed everything, including culture negative nutrient assays. That was like one of the key learning points. And so, um, uh, I, I, uh, was delighted to hear uh, to hear your reflections on that as well, because I actually didn't know the the historical context that it used to be thought of as a culture negative diagnosis.
All right, thank you, Jack. Um, let's get the mic to our dear friend, Madalena, to take us home. Uh, but before you take us home, Mohammed, any final words? Um, no, I think uh, it was, uh, it was, it was, that was the diagnosis and your approach to the case was very, uh, very useful. We learned a lot through the pearls and uh, it's really it's fascinating how diarrhea can also be uh, one of the symptoms of, of um, SBP. Actually, I had a study that was done on, fifth, uh, I think, 500 patients and 30% of them had diarrhea. Um, which does not actually make me think of SPP when, when someone tells me diarrhea and nausea and, and tells me more to think about something uh, wrong with the GI tract or some uh, anterior gastroenteritis or enteritis. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, thank you so much, everyone. Incredible. So can you all hear me, by the way? Just want to make sure it's working. Yeah, you sound great. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so I'll jump into some teaching points. What a phenomenal case and that you brought and what a great discussion. So we started with a discussion on abdominal pain and Reza brought this amazing pearl, I think from Charmin originally that because all the abdominal organs are so close together, a pathology in one can present as pain in a lot of different regions. So it's hard to put a lot of weight on the location of pain for abdominal pain because of the proximity of those organs. And while you know abdominal pain usually points to a pathology in the peritoneum, uh, there can be referred pain from the viscera, from kidney, heart, lung, even GYN. And we talked about at the very beginning that the CT scan is really the workhorse because very few diagnoses can be made without the help of the radiologist. And even when there are symptoms pointing to, you know, more GI causes of abdominal pain, you definitely um, don't want to exclude or you, know, you still want to keep cardiac causes um, high up on the differential because of the severe morbidity associated with those. Uh, then moving on, we had this really interesting discussion about nausea and its kind of specificity as a symptom. And so, you know, nausea is generally, um, you know, the autonomic nervous system is really what's responsible for nausea. And it's not very specific, but it is very sensitive. So when you do see nausea, it's a big alarm feature uh, versus if you have abdominal pain without nausea, it's um, a little bit less concerning. Uh, then when we got to the vitals in the case, uh, we Im immediately could kind of translate that into inflammation. And then if you combine that with the acute time course, we're able to prioritize infection over the other um, you know, options in the I made them on it. Uh, then as we got more data, we were able to see that this was a picture of decompensated cirrhosis, which we learned was an acute on chronic process. And to make that diagnosis, you either want to look for evidence of parenchymal dysfunction, so like an elevated INR, elevated uh, billy, or uh, signs of increased portal pressure. So some causes of you know, parenchymal issues leading to decompensated cirrhosis could be hepatocellular carcinoma. And then if you look at portal hypertension, um, that's worsened by reduced flow into the portal veins. So that could either be a vein issue, such as a thrombus decreasing the flow, or an arterial issue, um, for example, vasodilation from infection. Uh, and then when we got the um, acidic fluid results, we learned that we want to look at the SAG score. And uh, if the SAG score is elevated, uh, that's generally an indication of portal hypertension. And then if there's more than 250 neutrophils, that gives us the diagnosis of SBP. And something that I learned, which I didn't know, that spontaneous is generally monocrobial versus secondary is polymicrobial. So amazing teaching, amazing teaching during this case and case presentation. So thanks everyone. That's amazing teaching points. While in the middle of a rotation on lunch break, I don't know how you do it or why you do it, but it's absolutely superb. We really, really, yeah. Uh, Robbie, you're just a bad influence on anyone because <laughs> if you look at Robbie, he's like taking care of a patient, attesting a note and doing the MR. 
<laughs> you just you are the wrong influence my friend um, you know i uh, i will humbly uh, recognize that i do all that except i don't ever attest notes ever 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's the privilege of working at the va and with the best trainees in the country so uh, yes you're right but only 99 <laughs> percent. all righty see you all soon bye